takes boldness and courage to do that, and we can all learn a little bit from that, huh? Amen. Amen. Well, I have to start out um, by saying happy anniversary to my beautiful, lovely wife. I would like for you to come on up here for a minute. I have... I have some flowers for you and a box of chocolates. And, and there's more gifts coming, but that'll be later. But it's been 23 wonderful years of marriage to my beautiful wife. And God has been the center of our marriage and our life and our family and our kids. And, and he's going to continue to be. And uh, he's blessed us. And he's a good God. But I just want to tell you that I love you dearly with all my heart. You amazing, amazing woman, you're amazing wife, amazing mother, you're an amazing pastor, and just all that you are. You're beautiful inside and out. I couldn't have asked for anyone better. You're a perfect fit for me in our life, and just all that God has called us to do. You're just, you're very smart, you're very loving, you're very kind, you're very good. And I just appreciate you and all that you do. I love you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Now I've got to compose myself and go on. No. Um, last week we talked about unity within the body of Christ, right? And uh, before we even got online last week, we, we kind of talked about like imagining if all of us, before we got together on Sundays, if we woke up, we got ready, we we're having our coffee, we're on our way to church, that we're praying, we're in God's word, we're worshiping, we're saying, God, we surrender all that we want. Fill me right now. Help us when we get to church. We're all in line with you and what you're doing. And use me if you want today. I want to be ministered to and, I'm, and I'll receive all that. But use me if you want and be willing and able for God to use you. And we talked about being the Bible says that we should be perfectly united in mind and purpose, that we have the mind of Christ, but so many times as Christians, we don't use the mind of Christ, we use our own mind, right? We, we do what we think is best. We think we do what was, was right instead of surrendering that and saying, Christ, give me your mind, give me your thoughts today. Give me your agenda today. Give me your heart today. And in Acts 4, the, the church got together and they prayed. They prayed together in unity. And, and again, the, the call is Tuesday night, 7 o'clock here. Anybody can join who wants to come and pray. And then Wednesdays, the women get together and, and pray. And, and Ms. Yolanda's apartment, you know, at um, uh, Wednesdays, I think at 9.30, they start. Anybody can join. We talked about they had the early church had a boldness that they didn't fear. And that's something that really cripples us in our life sometimes, right? The fear of man, what people think, the fear of failure. What if I mess up? You know, all those things are real. They're legit. But praying, God, take away that fear in our lives and give us a boldness and a courage to step out in the things you're calling me to do. Because sometimes it is a little scary when God is calling us to do something, but he always promises to be with you. And he always has your best interest in mind. They, they saw signs and wonders. They saw the move of God moving among them. Don't you want to see that among us? Their prayer was a corporate prayer, a prayer of unity. They asked for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit filled them again. The same people that were filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost were refilled, showing us that we can continually be filled with the Holy Spirit, that God has more for us if we just ask. The gifts of the Spirit, the Word of God was to go forth, that we are to take God's Word and share it in love. And they were in one heart 
and one mind. It's where exactly God wants us. He wants our church to be one heart and one mind, his heart and his mind. And we looked over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and um, I want to read just a little bit of that because it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And in, and in verse 7 and following, it says, Now to each one the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determined. So he first says that each one, that these gifts were a momentary gift, that when we get together, the Spirit of God wants to pour out his gifts to every single person. And it may not be every person for that meeting, but he might use you for the next meeting. He might use you for today. We need to be expecting the Spirit of God to move among us, right? That's the first step. Because if we're just coming in expecting, okay, what's it going to be like today? I'm just going to sit here and <laughs> whatever the pastor does, he does. Or we can come in and say, God, I'm expecting you to use me. And then we need to be a willing, willing to do it. And then we need to be obedient to it. And this, let's be honest, it's not easy, right? Always being sensitive to the Spirit and being led and then taking that step of faith and being obedient, but it's always worth it. Remember, God will always be there with you and help you. He's never to embarrass you, but it's always for the building up for the common good. That everyone is to speak um, for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort, edifying the church. That that's, that's why God gives us the gifts to build one another up and not to tear one another down. And he gives those gifts as he determines, the Holy Spirit. So those are not gifts that we have all the time. It's, it's God-given gifts for us for that moment. Remember, this is a safe place that we can practice those gifts among us, right? That this is a family atmosphere, that it's okay to um, make a mistake. It's okay to be led by the Spirit and, and thinking you're being obedient. Maybe we mess up. I've messed up. But we have to have grace and mercy upon one another. We're all learning and growing in that process. Nobody has arrived to like, no, this is God all the time, 100%. We're walking through that process of opening our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes and our heart to the Lord to lead us and use us and guide us. But again, we just have to be expecting, willing, and obedient. Then he goes on and he talks about the body of Christ and, and that Christ needs to be the head, Ephesians 1.22. Meaning we don't come in here saying, I'm going to do my agenda, God piggyback on me and bless it. We come in surrendering to his will and saying, God, whatever you want to do among us, I want to be a part of that. But I surrender to what you want to do. Second, we need to act like one body. No longer someone over here doing this, other people doing this over that. We need that spirit of unity, right? The arm can't be doing stuff over here, the leg over here, the eye over here, the ear. We all have to come together. And what God has called us to do, because what you are called to do is not what I'm called to do, and vice versa. So we can't try to be somebody else. We have to be the best us that God has made us to be and use that for his kingdom and glory. But as we do that, then that spirit of unity comes, one heart and mind. We're to have equal concern for each other. Romans 12 tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. If you see your brother or sister hurting, go over there and comfort them. Right? You know, just practical things. Somebody's, you know, needing ministry. You see that, whether it's at the altar or over here or whatever. Don't just be cracking jokes with somebody five feet from them. Go out in the foyer or go over there, better yet, and start praying for them and start ministering to them. If somebody is blessed, don't get jealous, but rejoice with them. 
You know, we, we all get blessed at different times. You know, we all get, you know, God blesses us at different times. And we can't be like, oh, well, I've been praying for years and this hasn't happened and they get it. Oh, man. You know, we get that jealous spirit, right? Instead of saying, praise God. God's blessing you. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting on, on this, but I know God's got me. And he has blessed me. Rejoice with one another, coming together as one. If somebody's worshiping, don't, don't again stop and talk near them. Go worship with them. Being together as one. And it talks about different spiritual gifts yeah, um, are different. The ones we talked about where the Spirit of God is moving and it's a momentary gift. But then there's also gifting and callings that you have that God has imparted in you. You have a unique personality. God has given you a unique um, giftings and talents and abilities and that only you can use that to the full potential as in those things we are to use throughout our lifetime. So God is just continuing to work on our hearts, continuing to bring unity. And I know we're all on that path and we're all getting there together. I don't know about you, but I don't want to finish the race of what he's doing here at this church and in our lifetime alone. I want to finish with all of you. <laughs> I want us all together finishing that, that, um, that line together. So today we're going to be in, in John chapter 3. And this is a familiar passage to some, may not be to others, but don't close out what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you because his word is living and active and he has a word today for all of us. All right, in John chapter 3, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it, is, where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So... Every single one of us here have been a part of the birthing process, right? We have been born from our mother's womb. We came out and we have this flesh and blood that we can all see. But that doesn't make up who we are in its fullness. We have a soul that is part of our emotions and we have a mind, a part of our thoughts. And then we have an, a spirit, our heart, the innermost part of us that makes up who we are. And what happens is when we are born, because of the fall of mankind, because of sin that entered the world, every single person has been born into sin. We all, the Bible says, has fallen short of the glory of God. We've all messed up, right? Some point in our life, we have done something wrong, we've said something wrong, we haven't lived up to the full um, commands of God completely. And because of that, our bodies are wasting away, right? We're, we, we are all, we're, we're not getting better and stronger, we're, we're deteriorating. <laughs> we are all going to be six feet under. We are all going to return to dust one day. But then inside of us, that spirit Without Jesus Christ, that is darkened. It's darkened by the sin in our lives. And Jesus is saying that when you believe in me, then you are born again in your spirit. 
We don't see it with our eyes, so it takes faith, but that's what happens. Our spirit is reborn inside of us. The Bible says that we're crucified with Christ, but we're raised again, a new life, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So that even though on this earth, on this planet, while we're living, this body is going to deteriorate and waste away. There's a promise, the Bible says, that we, through Christ, will have new bodies that are imperishable, that will never die. Everything will be restored and brand new. But right now, as a believer in Christ, you've been born again. Your spirit has been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. That darkness has gone away by the light of Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. And we need to remember that as believers. We need to live like that. We are not to live as the world lives. We are to live in victory. The Bible says you are the head and not the tail. The Bible says that you have victory through Christ. You have freedom in Christ. You have hope in Christ. We need to wake up every morning saying this is a beautiful day that God has made and he has made me a new creation. So this is going to be a wonderful day because God's in control. I'm his child. I've been born again and I'm going to walk in who I am in Christ. Now we have to fight through this body. We have to fight through our mind and our thoughts and our emotions. But remember, when you are born again, you have power over sin, the Bible tells us. The power of sin and temptation that, that would hold us into bondage has been broken. That you don't have to live in that sin anymore. Does it mean we're going to live sinless? I wish that was the case. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but it means we don't have to walk in that. We can go from glory to glory. We can overcome those things, those things that held us down and were in bondage. We have victory over that, and sometimes we've got to remind ourselves of that. Because sometimes we feel weak, and we're tired, and we give in to that same thing over and over and over again when we need to rise up and say, no, 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 I'm born again. That power of sin is broken in my life. I don't have to live in that anymore. We have power over darkness. That darkness that clouds our minds, that darkness that brings despair and depression and discouragement, that darkness that comes in and just tries to lie to you and just say that you're not good enough, you're not worthy, that darkness that comes in to try to discourage us, we say, no, we have the light of Christ in us. That I have been crucified with all that stuff with Christ, but I'm raised again, born again, a new creation in Christ. And I walk in victory. I walk in the light. We have power over Satan because Satan is real and his demons are real and they come to steal, kill, and destroy. They come to attack us any way they can. If they can get at our finances, he will do it. If they can get at our property, he will do it. If he can use other people to try to manipulate us or try to discourage us or try to tear us down, he will do it. He will try to get in thoughts and whispers into our mind of just saying, man, you, you, you're just a mess. Oh man, God has left you. Oh, God is not with you. Man, you just need to give up, man. And you just need, whatever his lies are, we have power over that. And we need to remind ourselves what the truth of God's word is and not what we're hearing from anywhere and everywhere else. We have power over the world's influence, the world that's going to say, man, just, just be number one. Just live for yourself. Do what pleases you. It's all good. It's all right. What you believe is what you believe. What I believe, what I believe. You do what you do. Just don't murder me. I'll do what I do and everything's good. And God Bible says, no, 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 no. You live the way I called you to live. And you're going to walk in victory and freedom and hope and deliverance. Humble yourself. Give to others. Surrender your life to Christ. Live in that new life that I've given you. But walk in the light. We are a new creation, redeemed, we are restored, we are renewed, we have victory, we have freedom, we have hope, all through Christ Jesus. We need to wake up every day saying, God, what do you want for me today? Because we were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. We are not our own, we are God's. And that's a wonderful thing. 
We should ask God every day, God, fill me with your spirit and your holy word. Change me. Make me more like you. And use me for your glory. We should be praying that every day. He, Jesus goes on in verse 9. He says, uh, Nicodemus asks, how can this be? And Jesus said, you're Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. It's as simple as that. <laughs> okay, so what he's talking about, referencing in the Old Testament was the people were sinning. And venomous snakes came in and they started biting the people. And the people didn't die right away, but that poison goes in and it starts to slowly go throughout the body, right? And slowly start to shut all the good stuff down and slowly bring in death into every part till the person would finally die. Isn't that kind of like sin? Isn't that when we sin? It's like that poisonous snake that just slowly creeps in. Sometimes we don't even know it until it's too late. But it goes through and it spreads throughout, bringing death everywhere it goes. But God had a plan back then. He told Moses, Moses, make a bronze snake, put it on a pole, set it up. And then everybody who came and looked at that snake, they had to go to the snake. They had to look up to that snake. They were healed. It took faith. And what is faith? Faith is belief and action. Because the Bible says faith without works is dead. So we don't just believe, we have to act on our belief. And we don't just act and do the works of a Christian. We have to believe everything of God's word that is true and who Jesus is. So you, faith is belief and action. Those people, they were bit and the poison was going out. They had a choice. God didn't just heal everybody. And I'm sure there are ones that said, that's stupid. I'm not going to go look at a bronze snake. I'm going to go to a doctor. I'm going to do it my way. And guess what? Their way ended up in death. But G oh, um, what happens is the people who came, physically came and looked up, just like Jesus Christ, that we got bit by the poison of sin that is destroying our life. God said, I am going to provide a way through my son, Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection on the cross, that everybody who goes to him, everybody who humbles themselves and looks up to him and says, you are the only way to heaven. I can't get there on my way. I can't be good enough. I can't strive enough. I can't complete the law, but you did it for me, I believe. And when we humble ourselves and believe and look up to Jesus, then we are saved. We are healed. We are born again in our spirit. We can't save ourselves. <laughs> According to the Bible, we just we can't do it our way. There's all kinds of religions out there to say, do this, do this, do this, and you can make it to wherever. But only the Bible says, God sinned. His one and only Son. That He is the only way. We have to submit to Him and do it His way. Remember, He's God and we are not. We die to our old way of life and are born again, living in Christ for Christ. Galatians tell us, you know, we've been crucified with Christ, so no longer I living, but Christ is living through me. That's that's the plan. God fulfilling his mission and his plan through all of us as we die to ourselves and allow Christ to live through us. He go, Jesus goes on and says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what has been done has been done through God. God's love, God's love, that's what brought Jesus to the cross. His love is more than we could comprehend. His love is is greater than we could ever imagine. And If you ever doubt in your life that God loves you, because sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes we throw the pity parties. We've all been there. Oh, God has left me. Everybody's against me. Everybody's left me. I'm all alone. Nobody understands. I've been praying, and God doesn't hear me. God's not with me. God's left me. God do that. Woe is me. If you ever doubt God's love to you, go back to the cross of Jesus Christ. The pain and the suffering and everything that he went through. Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Because of that sin in our lives. Not only is God love, but he's God of justice. And there has to be a price that had to be paid for our sin. And you and I couldn't pay for that sin because we were all filled with sin. So Jesus Christ had to be born of a virgin, became a a human being with flesh and blood, but still maintaining his deity of being God. But he lived as you and I tempted in every way we were tempted, but Jesus Christ overcame and fulfilled the law that God had. He was sinless throughout his life. And he became that perfect sacrifice on the cross, taking your sin and my sin, the world's sin upon him, paying the penalty, paying the price for our sin. That's why God sent him. If there was another way, wouldn't God have done it? If there was another way that we could go to heaven, wouldn't God have done that? Of course he would. Because God sending his one and only Son, and the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one God. It's part of the Father being on that cross too. Giving that ultimate sacrifice, that ultimate expression of love. If there was any other way to get to heaven, he wouldn't have done that. But we had to have somebody pay our penalty, and Jesus did that for us. So when people reject Jesus, when people say, no, there's another way and I'll I'll go and I'll believe this, I'll do this or whatever. Do you think God who gave his only son is going to be pleased with that? Of course not. And we can't just throw Jesus into the mix. I'll believe a little bit of this, a little bit of that, throw Jesus in there. God says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. God sent his Son, and not condemning you, but saving you. Because sometimes we get to that point in our life where we've maybe walked away from God for so long, or maybe we've done a billion sins and some horrific things in our life, and we think, God cannot forgive me. God can forgive everybody else, but he cannot forgive me. I've done too wrong. I've walked away too long. Whatever it is, and Jesus is saying, I'm not condemning you. Come to me and I will save you. I will save you. Come as you are. You don't have to get cleaned up. You don't have to get perfect. You don't have to say the right words. You don't have to do the right things. You just have to come with your heart, humbly before him, saying, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. You be Lord of my life, and I'll follow you all the days of my life, and he will make you born again. And he saves us. 
He saves us from sin, right? Like we talked about before, that, that bondage of sin and, and the temptation and all that comes with it. He saves us from it. He washes us clean that all of our sin has been washed by the blood made in us white as snow. He saves us from hell because the Bible tells us there is a literal hell. And it's not meant for us. It was meant for the devil and, and his fallen angels. But people choose to go that by rejecting what God has done for them. But the Bible says that hell is a place of outer darkness. It's a lake of fire. It's a burning, but you never die because your spirit inside you never dies. <laughs> it never dies. And so in heaven, you're going to have eternal life. There's going to be peace and joy and love. But in hell, there's separation from God for eternity. So there is no peace. There's no joy. There's no love. There's no hope. There's no, none of that in heaven whatsoever. It's the worst place we could possibly be. But Jesus paid the price so we don't have to go there. We can rejoice. We don't have to fear hell. Because Jesus paid that for us. He didn't have to do it. But he loved us enough to do it. He saves us from that world system. Because what does the world have to offer us, really? Think about it. You can have the best political system... You can make a million dollars a month. You can live in a mansion, live on the beach, but your time's going to come, right? <laughs> and you, you, you can't take it with you, right? What does this world have to offer you? A momentary breath of life, of enjoyment? It saves us from that world system that lies to us, that says, do it your way and you'll be happy and blessed. But we, people find out they're not happy and blessed doing it their way, and they spend eternity in hell if they reject Christ. It's not worth it. It saves us from Satan's kingdom. That's going to lie to you. That's going to say, again, you're just not good enough. You're not worthy. You, bless, you blow it too many times. God has forgotten you. God has left you. Just give up. You know what? You're better than them. You don't have to listen to what they say. You don't have to do what they say. You just do your own thing. Do your own way. You have a better life. You know, all the things that Satan comes in to bring his kingdom, he makes it look so good. But then it turns out to be in a literal hell on earth and for eternity. And he saves us from ourselves. Because sometimes we're our worst critic, right? Right? <laughs> Sometimes we just, we just feel worthless. <laughs> we just feel like giving up. We feel like nobody cares about us. We feel like, where's God? Where's God when I need him? We feel like we just, the lowest of the low. But Christ saves us from that and says, you are not. You are cherished. You are loved. You're the apple of my mind. You're my treasured possession. I gave my all for you. And we need to remind ourselves of how Christ sees us, how the love of God has for us, remembering the cross and what he's done for us. That love for you is for today, that you are not worthless. You are worthy because he made you worthy. You are loved. You are precious. You are honored. You are cared for. He has a purpose for your life if you surrender it to him. And we need to remember that God has saved us from all these things. But the Bible says those who love darkness, those not willing to give up their evil deeds, remained in darkness. They rejected Jesus, the, the light. And so remember that, that sin, that you know, like the snake, that that sin goes in. And not only is our body decaying, but our mind and our soul and our spirit gets covered in darkness through the power of that sin that we've allowed into our lives. And unless we repent of our sins, meaning God, we're, we're not going to do it our way. We, we, we can't say, Jesus, come into my heart and then live the way we've always lived. That doesn't work that way. We have to say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me, cleanse me, and you be enthroned in my heart as my Lord. When we surrender him as Lord, we surrender, we become his servants. 
We become his slaves. We become his. He's bought us. But he's not a wicked tyrant that we're giving it to some evil person. We're giving it to a loving, good God who has the best plans for you. But he can't do that in and through your life if you're holding on to your life. If you're wanting to do what you want and just asking God to bless it, it can't work that way. Because only God knows what's best for you. He created you. He gave you your personality. He gave you your gifts and talents. He made you who you are. He put that spirit in you. And he says, I have great plans for you. Give me your life and I'll fulfill it through you. But the more that we fight with them, the more that we live our life for ourselves and do it the way we want, that sin comes back in and clouds it all up. And God has to continue to fight with his light. And he says, walk in the light that I've given you. Because that light will give you clarity of your life. Do you know what your purpose is in life? If you don't, that, it's clouded. God wants to bring revelation to you. Because he has a purpose for you. He has a destiny for you. He has a plan for you. Surrender your life to him and say, God, let your light shine. I give it all to you. And God will take you and use you and bless you. It says, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Jesus, again, is the way, the truth, the life. The word of God is the truth. When we live according to his word, we're walking in the truth. And then we walk in the light that darkness dispels. And we see clearly. We see clearly. Because the world's going to throw its agenda at you left and right. It's been doing it (laughs) since man has been on the earth. Everybody's going to give you their opinion. The news is going to give you their opinion. The politicians are going to give you their opinion. The sports figures are going to give you their opinion. The actors and actresses are going to give you their opinion. Your neighbors and your friends and your family are going to give you their opinion. But none of that matters. What matters is God's opinion. None of it matters. You are who you are because God made you, not because other people tell you who you are. And you're not even who you think you are. You you are who God says you are. And that's a beautiful, wonderful thing because God made you in his image. And he makes you born again, alive in Christ. And he's fulfilling his purpose and destiny through you as you surrender and walk in the truth and walk in the light. Faith, belief, and action. And in John 12, Jesus kind of continues on with this same line of thought and he's talking to people that are questioning him and he says in John 12 starting in verse 35 Jesus told them you are going to have the light a just a little longer walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you the man who walks in the dark does not know where he's going put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light You only have a limited time to decide. (laughs) Tomorrow is not guaranteed to anybody. But eternal life is guaranteed to those who believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you have been straddling the fence with Jesus Christ, the Bible says I'd rather you be hot or cold. God doesn't want people living in the world living in sin willingly, not willing to repent and give up, doing it their own way, and then just coming to church and, you know, praising God or coming online and, whoop, I'll get my little, my little pill for the day. No, God says, I want all of you. And the light is only here for a short time. We are only on this planet for a limited time. If it's not today, when? Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we can choose to reject him today or receive him, but it's got to be all in. Faith, belief, and action. we got to give up the old way of life and say, I'm born again, a new creation, Christ living through me. And we make him Lord of our life. 
And in verse 42 on down, it says, Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Don't let the praise from man stop you from the praise of God. Because that happens to some people. They're afraid. What if, are people going to label me a Jesus freak? Oh, you're one of those religious nuts? Oh, why, why are you not going to the bars anymore? Why are you not hanging out and, and doing these, these things anymore? It's because God has come into my heart. And that light has come in. And i got to expel that darkness. But some people love the praise of man more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe um, in me only, but in the one who sent me, the Father God. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Praise God for that. As for the person who hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And so Jesus is saying, hey, I've come to save you. I've come to redeem you, restore you, to make you whole, to make you pure light inside, born again. But if you reject me, then these words that you hear and know today, they're going to condemn you. And the Father, being the just God, will have to say, you rejected the way that I made for you to get to heaven. I gave my all for you, and you've rejected it. And then we become condemned because we reject the perfect gift that God has given for us. But the beautiful thing is that we have the choice to receive the light of Jesus Christ. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead three days later, and he's going to come back again, not to die again, but to take those who believe in him for eternity into heaven. But those who reject, the Bible says, will go into hell by their own doing because they rejected what God has done for them. And believers who already believe, I want to encourage you, walk in that light. Walk in that light. Don't let darkness overtake you again. You've been free from that. You're, you're set free from that. You, you can walk in victory. I don't feel like I walk in victory. It's a faith step. It's believing it and then stepping out into it. Saying, I may not feel that way today, but I know it's true because it's in here. I know it's true because I've been born again. I know it's true because Christ is living in me. The Holy Spirit is in me as a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance. The Bible says walk by faith, walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, live by the Spirit. We live according to this word and we're walking by the Spirit. That's how we live that victorious life. And those who are backslidden, who are just kind of half in the world, half out, I want to encourage you. God loves you, and he's calling you to give that up. And he's calling you to cross over. Fullness, not halfway in the darkness, halfway in the light, but the fullness into his light. And you will be blessed for it. Today is a day of salvation. And we have to believe, and then we have to take action. So, if your heart it's just saying, yeah, I, I, I hear you, Pastor. <laughs> I hear what Jesus is saying. And I want to give my life fully to Jesus. I want to walk in that light. I want to walk being born again. I believe what he's done for me. I'm going to repent of my sins and follow him all the days of my life. 
then I want you to just respond by coming up here and saying, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus Christ. And we're going to pray for you. And we're going to all pray together. But it's that action of saying, Christ, I give my all to you. I'm going to walk in that light. And for those who are watching online, just humble your heart before the Lord and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Change me, I'm a sinner. Make me born again and help me to follow you and walk in that light. But if anybody wants to do that now, come forward. Well, praise God. What we're going to do now, though, is, is pray this prayer together because maybe in your heart you're wrestling, but you say, you know what? I want to believe. And we're going to take that step of faith by praying this prayer and asking God to forgive us and come into our heart. So could we all bow our heads and close our eyes and let's, let's say this prayer to the Lord and if you want to, mean it from your heart. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be the light of my heart. Help me to walk in that light. Help me to live according to your word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Wash me with your blood. And make me a better person in Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that's just a first step of just in the direction that God wants to take us, walking in that light, being born again, living for God and not for ourselves. So be blessed today. Tell someone you love them and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And those online, if you have done that in your heart too, get a Bible somewhere. <laughs> um, we'll send you one if you need one. Get the Bible app. There's many of them out there that are free, but get into God's word. Be praying. Be seeking him every day. Don't worry about how to do it. It's not about performance with God. It's about your heart seeking after him. And God's going to continue to bless you and change you to be more like Jesus. So be blessed, everyone.